Well, hello there. Live from the Intercontinental Toronto Centre Hotel, I'm Susan Radojevic, and this is Corner Office. A quick sidebar from the start. You may notice that my voice is slightly off. That's because I'm trying to suppress a pesky cough. So you will see me stop to sip some water. I do apologize for, for that and just ask for your understanding. This is one of those unknown unknowns and the show must go on. So, we recently launched our Complexity series with special guest David Snowden, a pioneer in complex adaptive systems theory. Towards the end of the show, I asked David, Deborah Pickfield and Jean Le Tourneau to give us a tip that would help us start capitalizing on complexity. A few of you liked our suggestions and you told us about them, sorry. A few of you went a step further. You shared your ideas on how we can make Corner Office a richer experience. And for that, we thank you very much. We use some of your suggestions to bring you this month's Complexity Series installment. How to provoke creative leadership. And joining me to elevate the conversation is our very own Corner Office Explorer, Deborah Pickfield, Principal of ThinkSpot Burlington. Deborah's work is in collaboration. And Deborah says, effective collaboration is messy. Jean Le Tourneau is CEO of SBBCG Inc and a corner office explorer. Jean's passion is engaging with clients and all stakeholders to drive sustainable, long-term value creation for all. And our special guest is Shirley Knight, principal of Shirley M. Knight & Associates. Shirley helps leaders plan, structure, and create a culture for growth. Welcome, and nice to have you all in Corner Office. Yeah. Nice to be here, thank you. Yeah, nice to be here. Great. Before we get started, a few rules of engagement. After all, Corner Office is an intersection where conversations take place before, during, and after the show. And today, we are streaming live from the Intercontinental Toronto Centre Hotel. A Corner Office first. So, if you are watching us online and have a question, please use the chat tab found on your screen. If you are following us on our Twitter hashtag, CoLive, post your question using the hashtag. Maria, our community manager, is monitoring our channels and will make sure we get your questions. And if you are near the Intercontinental Toronto Centre Hotel, drop in and join our live audience and ask your question in person. Okay, with our engagement channels open, Let's get started. In the IBM complexity survey, over 1,500 CEOs cite creativity is what's going to help them deal more effectively with complexity. Creativity in this context is about creative leadership, a leadership style that's less about command and control and more about coaching and empowering. Research also shows that creative leadership is a learned behavior. What do creative leaders do differently? Who wants to start? Well, I'm not going to. You said I would be the one to get it. <laughs> Deborah's a keener. Just sit back. Deborah's a, uh, Shirley, why don't you just get our special <laughs> guest? Go. Okay, all righty. Well, it's, it's a good question because um, uh, creativity is a culture and leaders create culture and drive culture so it is like what do the leaders do is, is a really good question to ask. Um, leaders create the conditions for creativity and they empower people that's that is what they do. It is very messy mm -hmm. <laughs> to do that you make that point very well um, and this is where the distinction between a manager and a leader comes into play because creating the conditions for creativity doesn't necessarily imply any control. You, the good news is that people are all creative. We are all creative. And therefore, all companies are creative. So it's there. It's tapping into it. Um, and with the right conditions, you'll have it. How and when and where it actually delivers, you can't control that. And that's, and that's where um, a management mentality gets, it gets a little scary with this. 
But a leader, um, a creative leader has vision for the future of the organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they can talk about that in very tangible terms that people understand where they're going. And they also have a passion for getting that done to, and making that happen. So um, they, in the, in the context of that, they're very comfortable equally with success or failure. They are really comfortable on uncharted ground. It doesn't matter if they've never been there before. And um, but the, but the key to all of this is it's creativity with a purpose. What you're trying to drive in creativity is to better the organization in the long, in the long term. So um, it makes you more relevant, more valuable to your, to your customers, and uh, it makes you perform better, uh, increase your performance. That's the creativity, that's, that's the scope that you're trying to create. The leaders themselves, um, it's like when you're on an airplane, like put the uh, oxygen mask on you first before you start helping anybody else. So leaders know themselves and, and creative, good creative leaders know themselves really well. They know how they react to change. They know how they react to failure. <laughs> they, know, they know exactly how they are. And the other thing is they're really confident and we should all be confident because even if we're doing something we've never done before, we may not have the competency for that, but we have the capability. And creative leaders are conf confident in their capability. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to interject here because <laughs> you said about um, leaders need to let uh, go of control. Yes. Um, and some. S some leaders, that's a, that's a hard challenge for them to grasp because I think what they have to understand is that they, um, they can still be in charge, but they don't necessarily have control. <laughs> and Jean, what do you think about that as, as a CEO? <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that if there's a, you know, you could be a creative leader and you can still have control because to be creative is it a, a leadership uh, issue at the top? You know, and you, if you have a creative leadership at the top, does it mean that everyone in the organization have to be creative as well? Or if you have a very creative leadership with a good execution, you know, you need some controls in place because you have a vision that you want to execute and for execution you need some parameters. People need to know exactly what they do, where they, what they have to do and how they are expected to perform. And if that is clear, there's some, I'm not calling it control, because I don't like controls, but mm -hmm. I like to define parameters, mm -hmm. you know, within mm -hmm. which you can, here is where yeah. you can go, and here is uh, where you cannot go. So people have to know where they can go and where they can not go. So the control is not defined by, you must do one, two, and three, and four, but here is where you can and where you can't go. So you want people to feel encouraged so they could actually look for something different on how they could do something. I mean, even though they, they've got strict guidelines and parameters on how to do it, there's also ways of how could we at some point do something better, but it doesn't mean you go do it, make the change. But to back to the comment about creativity as leaders, I mean, on the last show we talked about, and I actually feel like I repeat myself a lot, <laughs> is that we can live with this uncertainty and that complexity. Mm -hmm. And I think a creative leader actually embraces that because Otherwise, you're, and we talked about this, otherwise you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, and that's useless, right? Because you're not going to be creative. The other thing I think about creative leaders is they actually understand that it's not about them. And so all their really? work. Really? Yeah. <laughs> mm, funny. And, and it's a really about empowering, as you talked mm. a few minutes ago, empowering everybody to find their own inner creativity and actually working together on that. And so the other thing I think um, is that they, they listen very well. And that's something that um, we need to, we really need as, as individuals to embrace that more. And that was my last suggestion last time was, how do you listen without even responding to somebody, something that somebody says? So where does trust, because we're saying that, you know, a leader is going to uh, relinquish control. Um, they're still in charge, but they have to relinquish control. So where does trust, how does trust fit in there? Because you ha in order for you to relinquish control, you got to trust people and how, um, the, the research that I read, there's not a lot of leaders that are really willing to trust that much by relinquishing that much control in order to empower. I think there's some things that you, when we talk about relinquishing control, I'm, I'm, I think this might be appropriate to define the term. Um, there are things that a leader, creative leader, would control. And, and I'm thinking 
um, right now about cultural underpinnings of creativity. They would control that. So for example, um, bonuses and promotions work really well if you want people to do the same thing all over again and, and run down. They focus people and they narrow people and they do it better faster. In a creative environment, they actually inhibit creativity, those, that kind of a bonus structure or mm -hmm. extrinsic. It's intrinsic uh, motivation that, that works for people. Um, uh, personal mastery, the ability to get better at things, um, a higher purpose, things that, uh, that I am serving a higher purpose and that, and that energizes me. Autonomy, you can, you can let me do my work at my time because you trust and you know I am creative and I will and I am, you have told me the vision and the purpose and I will work with that. And so that's where the leader actually does control um, how the motivators are in place and that's really what determines the culture to what people get rewarded for and recognized for. And a leader can do that quite well. And I think uh, <clears throat> For building trust, you know, in your team, you need to know your team. Yep. And it takes a deep knowledge of your trust, of your team, and alignment of the people and what you think. And if you don't have the right people, you know, not sure that you can work with these people because trust will never come. You know, uh, trust has to be uh, uh, around values that people will share. And trust has to be, if you're a CEO and you want to relinquish control, you have to trust that the job will get done. So <clears throat> there, there's a need for a very strong alignment and the trust comes from what people do and how they interact together and how they really work to get the job done together. And I, I was wondering too, when you talk about trust, I mean, perhaps when executives are feeling, well, how much of the shareholder is going to appreciate the fact that, you know, let go of relinquish control to me <laughs> as far as, you know, I felt. Yeah. I, I, don't like that word failure, but mm. yeah, they, I mean, that's the expectation, right? That they're going to keep meeting increased profitability. So uh, they're feeling, well, I can't, I got to keep tight reins on this, wherein the trust only happens when you actually let people just, with, with guidelines, say, you know, I'm taking a chance here and, and let it go. And, and that's when you start to build up the trust when you're consistent. So mm. that's hard sometimes that's for people. And it, so it's more about asking. Um, for people to, um, asking the leaders to trust the people and the people understanding what the parameters are and where they have control and where the leader has control. Is that what we're saying? Well, the leader's creating the conditions and, and, and that is all of the parameters. So they're creating the conditions for people to be free. To, uh, to contribute, or that free to create, to be empowered to create. So creating those conditions is a lot of really important work. The how that it actually happens, it, it does, you don't have to be involved. That's where the coaching comes in, the coaching people and helping them in the how. Once you know the what and the why, then the how is, is typically what anyone would do anyway. But, um, but that's where the coaching is to help them with the how. And, and, and I think, um, or not. Or cut them loose with the house. So, yeah. so it's to create a lot of diverse thinking is what we're we're we're, we're trying to accomplish here by by being more creative in, in the way we lead. Yep. We're also going to create an environment, and we're going to create a lot more diverse thinking, which will initially then lead to more innovative and products and services. And if you look at top leaders that are really that are creative, that their companies perform, they have a very diverse team around them. The executive team has very different capabilities and different orientations, and, and so it's almost enforced creativity because everybody's got a different perspective. Yeah, it's so, not black yeah. and white, it's more... Yeah. And, and the leader is accepting it day to day. Between, yeah. It's not like, you know, thinking about it once in a while. It's like every day I'm interacting with people with different perspectives, and I am welcoming that. Yeah. Right. And I also like to think of it as giving permission from both sides. So, you know, you might want to say, Deborah, I'm giving you permission to step up, and I can't hide any longer. I can't pretend, oh, I'm just going to go with what Jean's saying because, you know, Jean's always good and he gets the right answers. No, I've got to step up. So yeah. I'm giving permission, yeah. Yeah. but then the, the, the executive needs to give the permission as well to, or, that they're not going to be the one that controls it. So it's that mutual. Mm -hmm. You can't hide, and you also got to take a step back. So. Okay, well, uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, Deborah, Jean, and Shirley are going to suggest some experiments for us to do to be more creative as, and to lead more creatively. Don't go away.
And we are back. This is Corner Office, live from the Intercontinental Toronto Centre Hotel. And I'm Susan Radojevic, and in conversation with Deborah Pickfield, Jean-Luc Tourneau, and our special guest, Shirley Knight. We are talking how to provoke creative leadership. And we have a question, apparently. We broke away, and we were going to start our experiments, but we have a question right now. Maria, what's the question? So the question is, um, what would be, in your opinion, key barriers and constraints for organizations to overcome if they're to develop a cadre of creative leaders? So, who wants to take that one? And Did the question I, come for, so, yes, for somebody I particular? Yes, the question was for Jean. Oh. Ah, okay. Um, I think the, uh, the organization has to work on because you can create a, a creative leadership environment, but unless you can train people, but unless you remove the constraint, what is making people not being uh, creative, you're gonna fail. You know, in my past experience, I remember one of my employee that, you know, I was expecting and I was working with her and we were training her and coaching her to become more creative but because she had been working there for 22 years and she had seen people coming over and over, she did not believe that the organization was going in that direct direction. So even though we would provi provide more training to her, she just could not change, you know? So when it's nice to talk about creative leaderships, but when you're a creative leader, you need to understand who on your team will be able to follow and make sure that you create conditions and you remove the constraint of what will make people not being uh, creative. Okay, well, we hope we answered that question. Um, I want to now... Can I just jump in a little bit on Do that you wanna... one? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, I did. I alluded to it with the, uh, the compensation structure is, is something to... If, if, if you want to create creative leadership, so you have to create the conditions for them to work. And, and, and if you know scientifically, proven by MIT and London School of Economics, you know that a bonus structure destroys creativity. Th like you have to take, if you're gonna realistically create people who, who are gonna do this, you have to take a look at those underpinnings. And the other one that we were talking about a bit before the show, you have to take a look at how you treat failure, <laughs> whatever you're calling failure. Like when, when people take legitimate risks and it doesn't work out the way they wanted it to, how are you going to treat that? Like, how's that going to happen? And to your point on trust. Mm -hmm. So where are the underpinnings in your culture? That, and that's, that's where the leaders is, it, yeah, there's some training that goes with that. But just to say we're going to make a bunch of leaders is, no, you're going to have to create the conditions for a bunch of leaders. And that, that means being consciously competent about culture and how to use it uh, to your advantage. That's, uh, that's good that you touched on, on failure because that's mm -hmm. the second part of our, mm -hmm. our, ex our show. And the first part of the show, we talked about the creative leadership and the concept and what, how, how do you need to create an environment, you need to be more open, collaborative, trust people, um, relinquish some of the uh, control, but still be in charge. So this part of the show is about doing an experiment. So here's how it's going to work. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and Jean and Deborah and Sean yeah, and Deborah. Deborah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sean. One of them. <laughs> it's the medication. <laughs> it's the medication to suppress my cough. Kicking You're too in. Much on drugs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Where do I get Jean, Deborah, and Shirley are going to have each two minutes to answer the question by offering an experiment that we can do right away or in time to either develop our own creative leadership style or cultivate leaders within the organization. So, um, feel free, for, for the folks online, feel free to, um, to ask a question if something is unclear about the experiment that um, Jean, Deborah, and, um, and Shirley are going to share. And I'm going to ask the question, and I want to make sure that Maria is ready with the stopwatch when, uh, when we start. <laughs> I want her to take away yes. a minute from Shirley and give it to me. <laughs> so here's the question. <laughs> a minute. Now, now. Well, we can I need to separate the two of you. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a fight. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay. And it's it's kind of piggybacking on on what um, 
what Shirley mentioned earlier, but we've been conditioned to be afraid of failure. And we don't even like the word failure. We think it's totally bad. But creativity requires us taking more calculated risks where there is, a, where you have to do some experimentation and there is a level of an un unavoidable failure. So how do we encourage risk taking and learning from failure and how do we measure the success of that? Who wants to go first? Am I allowed? Yes, you're the guest. <laughs> I'm the you guest. Can, you can do that. Theoretically. <laughs> we have more time to, how to think about how to beat you up. <laughs> okay, Maria, is the stopwatch ready? Well, I, have, I did have, uh, I have a, an exercise, and it would involve, uh, I actually had two of them, but I'll just do one. Um, and, and to your point on listening, uh, but personal mastery is, is, uh, and self-awareness is a critical ingredient, uh, ingredient rather, of uh, leadership. And, and, and leaders have impact just a hundred thousand times more than they think they do. So, so how you behave is really what sets the stage for what you can or can't do. So my idea is that you Your would, experiment. My experiment <laughs> is that you'll spend a week, you as the leader will spend a week um, not talking, only listening. Mm -hmm. And the only time that you can talk is to ask a question. So while, wow. while that's happening, so while that's happening, um, um, you'll, you've got two levels of observation. You observe yourself and observe the people who are around you, your direct reports. So yourself, how's that, how's that working for you? <laughs> Not being able to say anything. Mm -hmm. Everybody and, would be scared. And, and, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and while you're doing that, what are you learning? What are, what are you hearing from people that, mm -hmm. uh, that you, uh, you didn't know, that, that you didn't, that was a surprise for you or, or not. Um, and then observing the people, how comfortable are they with you just listening? And, um, and then do they eventually, do they keep going to you for guidance or do they actually pull back and say, okay, if you're just going to ask me questions and listen, I'm going to think of things and, 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 see, and see how it is that um, they, uh, they react to that. And, and then, you know, the last thing is, um, is to think about during that time while you're listening, how do I handle failure? How do I personally feel about failure? And to, so just to spend that week, that whole agonizing week of just, just listening and learning and practicing that and, um, and then taking a look at what results that gave you. What, what did you learn from that? What would be the success for that? How do you measure the success of that? The, we, the measure of success is that you were able to do it. <laughs> not to, not to talk. <laughs> And can I add to that? Yes, that, yeah, that absolutely. Is, yeah. is when you're listening, is being fully present, right? Yes, so good just, one. You know, just good like, one. don't be what sitting there. What does that mean, being it means, fully present? Oh, and, and it is the hardest thing, I, I swear. But it's not thinking about, well, you My know. grocery list? Yeah, <laughs> so, well, that, yes. Exactly. But what happened in the past, or, you know, and I'm pretty sure I know what you're saying. It, it's just to really be fully engrossed in what that person's saying and not thinking about the future or the past. And it's the hardest thing we do. I, it is a constant struggle for me, and I don't do it very well at all. But occasionally, for a moment, it will ha happen. Um, what so. do they say? We uh, we have two ears for for what? We have two ears and, and one, one mouth. mouth. Yes, yes. Yeah. we yeah. talk right. the most. But we're always we're usually thinking, what is it we're going to say? And that's the beauty of what Shirley's suggesting, right? We, it doesn't that's, matter what we're going to say because yeah. we can't say it. Can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's why I think it's a great suggestion. That is a great, great yeah. suggestion. I'm yeah. going to try and do that. Yeah. Oh, good luck with that, <laughs> Susan. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I need to hey, walk Maria. the talk now. I'm going to try and not talk for a week. <laughs> How are you going to manage that? <laughs> okay, um, who wants to go up next with their experiment? You, you want to go? No. She's uh, not a keener this time. No, around. I'm really, I'm really just playing the complete opposite. I, mean, I, I would okay. suggest an experiment over a, a period of three months. Uh, and three then, months. Yeah, it, it's because it's something you cannot <clears throat> just get results overnight. But when people come to you with projects that are long-term projects, and uh, sometimes many CEOs get projects in front of their face, and they don't get any results, you know, it takes three years to get results. By the time the projects is done, teams are put together, you know, everything and all the logistics is going, and the people start to work, and the uh, impact is going. The thing is to, to do some experiment is to take those big projects and to break them into smaller pieces. Okay. And, uh, and change, in some instance, the way of measuring how projects are being successful by looking at our, budge our projects on time, on budget, 
but much more understanding the business impact and getting the people engaged in the rolling out of the project. And making sure that you're not moving beyond the first three months if you are not going where you want to go. This is how you can experiment, learn quick, fail quick, and if it doesn't work, you don't move beyond. I mean, too many times I've been in companies where people work on a three-year project, the project does not make any sense, the assumptions are not good, but you know what, we're on time, one budget, and we're doing it. So people don't care if it's gonna work at the end, but they are on time, on budget. So we need to move <laughs> on shorter, shorter time frame with different objectives, not on time, on budget, but what will be the impact on the business, and do we have the people engaged, working on the project, customers of the project that will be with us along the way. So um, it's kind of like you're, you're addressing the results as they emerge. So you're, you're I mean, you're experimenting and you're going and doing things for three months, but you're looking at results <coughs> as you as, go, as they go along. and see w is it yeah. moving in the right direction as opposed to wait three years down the road and you took and you decided to do that project because someone else did it somewhere else into another company. And you in your model, the would, you allow people, would you allow people to change things? Is that what, you're, mean, is that what you're suggesting? You know, obviously, when you go from uh, the NASA to the moon, mm -hmm. you know, even if there are thousands of computers, every one mile, they are changing directions. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why, you know, despite of all those brains working behind that, they have to change directions every one mile, and there's 250,000 miles. Yeah. So how, how in the world can you expect to go on a $5, $25 million project, I mean, I work with a big financial institution. They were into a five-year projects. And uh, one of the key person in the project said, you know, we had all those big ideas up front. We are three years into it. We have spent 25 million, but we don't know where we're going. Can you help mm. us to define where we're going at the end? So, you know, it's like it, it's a big project. It's not broken down in small pieces. It does not allow you to track if you're moving in the right direction but you're just working on a big thing. Okay, that's two minutes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. any me, comments? Me. Oh, you, oh yeah. you want to do? Okay, no comments. Uh, Deborah, oh Peters. yes, okay, sorry, do we, no. do we comments on Jean's No, no, first? I'm just, if there isn't, if not, you go right ahead and give us your experience. No, but I liked your example. That was a really great example. Yeah, we have a week and three months. Yeah. Okay. So mine's very different. I'm actually cribbing from, um, some really great cribbing. Cribbing, meaning I'm cheating. I'm taking it from <laughs> other people, from what org they've. Uh, so I was in an event last week, um, Association of Career International Career Professionals, and a gentleman spoke from ING Bank, and he had a great way of how they. They're very innovative. Yeah, they're they're excellent. amazing. Um, so I have an example from them. I have an example from the woman who spoke from the Conference Board of Canada. Uh, they have a new study out, which is really pretty amazing. But I'll tell you what happens at ThinkSpot. Something so simple, which is the dismissive hat. Um, it's just letting this hat will go flying around the room because people are realizing as soon as they shut somebody down, they've lost an idea. So that would be my one little suggestion. It's something simple, but it works. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be, it's, you know, it's an old ski hat I had, but it just flies around the room. But what ING does is they have a penguin. They give a penguin award for people who actually take the risk. So if you think of the March of the Penguins movie, where there was one penguin who had to, they're all waiting to go in the water, and there was one that will go and make sure it's, you know, find out what's going to be eaten by a seal. <laughs> so they give a, a, a penguin award to the person who will actually take the risk and go in because um, they really appreciate employees taking that, uh, willing to be taking the risk. But what I loved was the Conference Board of Canada's um, study on immigrants and how they are the best at being innovative and creative because mm -hmm. they've left, they've gotten up and moved exactly. from a country. So when you think about it, well, does that mean for people who actually change a number of jobs, that maybe they're more open to risk and more and willing to take chances? Well, and I, I think there is a lot of merit to that. So immigration, people who've immigrated, um, people who've actually been saying, you know, I'm not spending 20, another, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate people who've been there 20 years, but maybe the ones who've been there three or four, and then they're kind of going, okay, I'm ready to try it again and have to re and kind of find my way through another organization. So, my my suggestions are one, the dismissive hat. It's it, the not letting people, you know, having that penguin award. I thought was brilliant by ING. Um, I wouldn't use the word failure. I would actually say if somebody uses it, they have to contribute five bucks, and every time you get enough, you buy a lunch for the team. But I just failure wouldn't be in my lexicon and. Um, I would encourage the, uh, the fact that it's the little small things that can make a difference. 
So, okay. I mean, <clears throat> if you work on a smaller project and it does not work and you stop after three months, it's not a failure. It's a learning. Mm -hmm. Yes. So why exactly. would you go if it's exactly. not creating the, you know, the impact of what you thought originally? Yeah. The failure is when you, you know, like we were talking earlier, is when you keep going mm -hmm. and you are going nowhere. Yeah. And you keep going and you go nowhere. Yeah. So that's failure because yeah. at the end you end up, you know, having no impact and having spent three years and lots of money sometimes to get to nothing. Right. You know, I saw a great tweet the other day on Twitter. Um, it said, the opposite of success isn't failure, it's complacency. Absolutely. It's I a great quote. I thought that was quote. a fantastic yeah. tweet. Yeah. Uh, it was and great. I worry about Canadians. Sorry, this is it. I actually worry that we are complacent. We had, we had a little... <laughs> Do you know we have what? time? Do we have time for the Canada commercial? <laughs> we have time. Do we have I've time got for... a two-minute Canada commercial. Uh, you, you can't have two minutes. Okay, oh, one minute 40, Canada commercial. No, 40, 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Um, Canada is poised to be the next world superpower. And, and I would just hope that the leaders listening would, would seize that and say, wow, we could really do something here. Tenth largest economy in the world, uh, third largest supply of oil next to Saudi and Venezuela. Um, excellent schools. We've got um, uh, the chemical industry is being repatriated. It's coming back. Uh, World-renowned expertise in mining. And we have a very stable and good central bank. Mm -hmm. So there is, and, and people love Canadian leaders globally. You, Canadian leaders, you might not know that, but they do. <laughs> and, um, and, and because we work so well, we don't enforce a culture, we work with people. That's, that's the Canadian way. So this is our moment. We're diverse. And, and, we're, and don't hold mm -hmm. ourselves down because we're afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Like just, I just don't. This is our moment. We can really jump out and the world's waiting for us to do it. And we're the best people to do it. I don't think um, I don't think we, it's that we're afraid of failing. We're just um, I don't know what it is. We just don't want to be the first to do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's. I, I really don't think it's about failing. I think that we just. Because don't there's want a to lot the of first. entrepreneurs coming out of. I mean, exactly. there's a yeah. lot of places that'll tell you the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. Um, it's also it's almost it's almost it's a as though we're, we we don't want to be in people's faces. It's like, you know, we're the nice people. We don't want to be like we're grabbing the spotlight. I think it's time we grab the spotlight. Yeah, but, yeah, I bet, but you know. you're, you're right. Again, it's about having the uh, the conditions in place to, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have access to money, you may have the best ideas in the world, but if you don't have access to the market or the money, you know, through the money, to execute, then yeah. you're bound to fail. So there is a lot more money, you know, on the south side of the border than there is in Canada. So that's why, in many instances, sure. ideas yeah. are For easy sure. to come on the other side. Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, you know, and I agree with you that Canada has uh, all the, you know, the right conditions and the right environment. It's oh, just it's that a uh, in time. we it's have a to focus in time. on the positive and not yeah. look as much as uh, uh, cost uh, reductions, but cost contractions, but grow the economy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's the key Girl. thing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well. Growth. We have to wrap it up, folks, because we've, we've gone a little bit long, but um, oh, that geez. means it was a good conversation. <laughs> so what, we're, what I'm taking away from this is that I have to stop talking for a week. <laughs> and listen. Well, yeah, which will be good for your, your <laughs> call. Exactly. Perfect. Now's a good time good for me timing. to do that. Exactly. Good timing. Um, diversity in the workplace is good. Uh, creating diverse thinking. Diverse thinking, diverse is, thinking great. is really important. Um, we're, we're not going to use failure. We're going to use false starts. False start. Uh, uh, first try. First I tries. Initial effort. Experiment. Okay. Initial experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got to trust. <laughs> provide parameters. Um, what else? I think that kind of encapsulates everything. We need to catapult Canada into world leadership. And we got to get up there and say, <laughs> Take the limelight. That's exactly. Canada. And you got to okay. recognize the people who take the risk, right? That's yes, right. You got to celebrate good. them. You yeah, really, excellent. for somebody yeah. to put themselves out there, and even if it's disagreeing yeah. with you, then that's they need to be acknowledged no, for that's risking. That's what you need to promote people to disagree because yeah. if you have a bunch that's of right. executives around the table and all they do is smile and nod, you know. Yeah. And leaders need to role model that. Yeah. Their that's acceptance true. of controversy and their yeah. their uh, enjoyment of diversity. Yeah. And well, I'm going to acknowledge the great people around this table today. So thank you, Shirley Knight, Deborah thank Pickfield, you, and Jean Le Tourneau for being in Corner Office today, for sharing your wisdom. It's been great. Uh, Corner Office Complexity Series, How to Provoke Creative Leadership, is locked in. If you would like to watch this episode again, it is being recorded and will be available for viewing next week on our webpage, Corner Office Episodes. 
our website is theperegrineagency.ca. If you have thoughts on today's show, go to our website and click on the agency blog and post your comments. Find us, find us on Twitter, our hashtag is COLive, or follow me at Susan Radojevic. Bookmark our agency blog and be the first to hear about our Complexity Series April show. If your organization has a business method, tool, or technology our community should know about, go to our website and click on Contact Us. That's, I think, a wrap. Thank you, Maria, and a big shout out to our sponsors and, pa and partners coming up on your screen. Check them out, folks. And finally, thank you for participating and watching today. See you next time. For Corner Office, I'm Susan Radojevic, logging out.